invited our storytellers to come do this tonight, I had no idea what they would write. Given the prompt radical love, any number of things come to mind. Meeting someone cute at a protest, maybe, or deciding that your love for someone cute doesn't need to be bound by the rule of one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe they would write about parenting, about activism, about selfless acts of service. Maybe they would write about bell hooks, who knows? And I'm not gonna tell you. This introduction is a spoiler-free zone. Except to note that the stories they came up with struck me with how much they had in common, despite the fact that each of them are coming from very different places. Like, literally, you'll see how important place is in each of these stories, how love is never something we conjure on our own. So we have three storytellers joining us up here, and I don't know how many storytellers we have around the corner working with Hasmin, who is facilitating a storytelling workshop with the younger people. So the way that this evening will go is that Senyo will come up here first and tell a story, and then Lakeisha will come up here, and then Ricardo will come up here, and then any of those storytellers working on their stories over there will come up here, and then we'll all have a discussion as a community. Sound good? Wonderful. All right, thank you very much, and let's welcome Senyo to the stage. Thank you. Round of applause for Corey Paz and Jesus. <laughs> uh, radical love. When I thought about love in general, um, I thought about this universal force that binds us all together, and you know things that's just overwhelming um, when you're trying to trying to form it into a piece uh, to discuss. The first time I actually felt love, though, was about nine years old. Um, I had a really good friend that wasn't bound by what other people thought of him. And he, he, he extended himself in a way that I feel is rare for, for young people. So I wrote a story about it, and here it goes. The first person to really hold me down as a friend was Terrence. We were nine, and I was two years fresh to the U.S. from Ghana and bailing out of place. I was used to roasted plantain and peanuts, weekends in the village with no running water, running barefoot, playing world football in the middle of the streets. I was feeling my way around American slang and the Chicago Bulls and VH1 and the mysterious spicy ketchup everyone kept calling mild sauce. Uh, <laughs> I was stir crazy trying to sort out my two conflicting worlds when he introduced himself. Hi, I'm Terrence. You knew? Confident, smiling, his arm extended. The kid had charisma. He twinkled with the soul of a comedy giant. And if he liked you, he definitely joked you out. That's how he showed love. His brand of ribbing was the exaggerated sort. Insults so out of this world you couldn't possibly be offended. Like, boy, your head's so big, you gotta get a running start before you wake up in the morning. <laughs> He'd crack on you and be so hysterical himself, you couldn't help but laugh along with him. He was magnetic, and when he insisted I be his friend, I knew I never stood a chance. Prior to Terrence befriending me, my life in the U.S. was Thundercats, E-Man, MC Hammers, You Can't Touch This, and Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation. I could usually be found after school on the playground where I preferred to sway slowly on the swings, with my bare feet dragging through a mix of sand and wood chips. Every five passes, I push off the ground again, gathering just enough momentum to continue swaying. I had a few friends, but I was no social butterfly by any stretch of the imagination. But things would change in a hurry when I met Terrence. We just decided we were cool. And before I knew it, we were on one hilarious roller coaster after another. Now the bus stop before school, always a spectacle. The thing I recall most was spending way too much of our time memorizing Bone Thug and Harmony verses. 
<laughs> Think about back in the day when the year was 89, little homie on the ground trying to get my do my time with too many years. Stuck in my fist, get my fair down on nothing. And I, nah, hitting up the graveyard shit for real, little Will Big Wally and Wishbone. Lil Wally, now how roll blood and you want to run hitting so strong. <laughs> One, one thing, one thing I'm convinced about to this day is nobody knows the actual words to a bone. You just kind of fake it till you make it. But that was our real homework. Like, if, if you hadn't memorized your verse from East 1999, you couldn't be in our circle. It just wasn't happening. We were serious about bone. I was crazy bone. Terrence was lazy bone. We had a friend named Raj. That was Raj. That was Wish. And Victor was busy bone. See, Victor was the closest thing we had to a light-skinned dude, so he had to be busy going. Um, we even had Martel, who hung with us every now and then, but he wasn't ready to memorize all the lyrics, so he had to be flesh. <laughs> See, the fast-paced lives of nine-year-olds in the in-crowd was a whole new universe for me. I had been a homebody all this time, but I was ready to break out of my shell, and Terrence accepted his role as my guy. He and I would hit the local convenience store up, splitting up our mother's laundry money with crybabies, sugar daddies, Chico sticks, Funyuns, hot pickles, honey buns, and flaming hot Cheetos, making sure to devour the contraband as to leave no trace and no suspicion. After our snacks, Terrence insisted that we ought to hit the blacktop. Two full-length outdoor basketball courts gated with bleachers. You'd see somebody cut a hole in the gate with bolt cutters, so everybody entered and exited through the hole instead of the gate entrance, which frustrated the park attendant to no end. <laughs> Roberto Clemente State Park, written in bold at half court. There was a court for the bigs, you know, high school guys, college, adults, all running full court games to 11 by ones. We would sit on our bikes or against the gate and watch in amazement as the older guys would talk trash and put on a show with flashy ball handling the high flying dunks. Oh man, I've been giving you buckets all day, baby. He can't guard me. Shorty, you think he can stick me? It's all net, baby. He can't see me. We'd be nearly in tears laughing at the bigs. The John back and forth was almost as much entertainment as the game itself. And one of the older guys would make a shot, wink at us, or give us a high five on his way back to play defense. That instantly gave us the juice. Now, the court on the other side was for the smalls, middle school and under. For us, the basketball court is where legends were made through everything but playing basketball. Whether it's a slap boxing contest that turned into an actual fist fight, or learning to wheel your bicycle from one end of the court to another. I even got my first kiss at Roberto Clemente State Park. We earned everything we got on that 94-foot stretch of blacktop. And to think, I used to be on the outside looking in at this world. But with my newfound friend Terrence as my passport, I got to experience a world that I would have deemed a rumor otherwise. My favorite part of our day was the walk home. With Terrence leading the pack, we'd skip stones and swing on these monstrous tree vines on the lake adjacent to our apartment building our feet skimming the surface of the lake before we made it back to the embankment. More often than not, we would complete the walk home afterwards with our socks funky and wet. And that was our thing, a ritual to get our kicks in before we retired to do our bids of schoolwork and household chores. The only time I ever missed our walk was the day I served my first detention. It was for stealing the clay project in our class. These projects were change holders or teacups formed by hand, painted, and glazed, then stuck in the oven until they reached a glossy finish. I hated art at that age, basically because I was terrible at it. But hell, I wanted a cool change holder. And it just so happened the third grade art class messiah, Leah Dixon, went to the washroom right before our projects came out of the oven to cool off. So I stole her project and put it proudly on my desk. I realized a little late, though, that the colors on my paintbrush didn't quite match the project sitting in front of me. But by then, it was too late. I had already committed. Just gonna lie my way through this one. 
I saw Ms. Rasmussen, the art teacher, squinting her eyes and nose at me. She was getting ready to call me out. Senor, I don't think that's yours. I panicked. I had been exposed. But I wasn't ready to throw up the white flag just yet. What I was ready for is a small spectacle. And so I did what any stupid nine-year-old would do. I flipped her off. <laughs> 24 little third graders with their eyes bucked, singing in chorus. Ooh. <laughs> Ms. Rasmussen, one of the palest women I'd ever met, was now flush red. She pointed straight at me. Bring it up. You have a detention! <laughs> After serving my sentence in school, I walked straight home to do my homework. My mom decided she'd deal with me after dinner. A few hours later, she called me into the living room. There was barely any music in her voice, which was rare for my mom, even when she was mad. This wasn't about the detention. Did you see Terrence in school today? I mean, did you walk home with him? I saw him at school. I didn't walk with him, though. I had a detention, remember? Oh my god, honey, I'm so sorry. What? It's on the news, baby. Terrence, he died today. Oh. It got cold in the room. Apparently, on the way home, after the park, Terrence stopped by our tree for a routine swing on the vine over the lake, and the vine snapped, and he fell in. A young lady who witnessed the event recounted Terrence splashing and struggling in the pond. She could barely see his face, but could hear him pleading for his life, screaming that he could not swim. She went on to explain that a man tried to help Terrence using a long branch, extending it to him. He was able to grip the branch, but as Terrence tried to walk towards solid ground, the mud slowly sunk in. And the harder he struggled, the further he disappeared into the water until he was, there was no more struggling and no more sign of Terrence. Watching the news together in the fog, I withdrew further and further into myself. After a while, my mother's voice was merely just background noise. I flashed to the most consistent image I had of Terrence, the last time we were together. That same morning in the cafeteria, him laughing hysterically, jumping up and down with his arm around my neck. I got emotionally high thinking about Terrence and then suddenly low when I realized he was no longer with us. It's a heavy day. If I learned anything from Terrence, it was how to be in the moment and only to do the things that got me excited. I was ready to live without fear. Nine years old and Terrence already had life figured out so well that the universe called him home. More than a friend, more than a brother, I had been afforded the rare privilege of communing with an angel who taught me how to love myself and the world around me. So that was a sad one, um, but there's love in it, and I think it's, uh, it's inherent in the way that Terrence handled me. I was um, from Ghana, out of place, and I don't know who, who put that in him, but he had it in his spirit to say, you're gonna be my friend. And I think that's a very, very radical act in itself, um, especially we, we have a hard enough time doing it as adults. So as nine years old to do something like that, I felt like that was a, a, a good example of radical love. So into hearing more stories, wonderful stories about radical love, I'd like to invite our next reader, Keisha, to the stage. Please, a round of applause for Keisha. So my 
radical act of love was learning to love myself in a major, major way. So, um, in a very freeing way. So I guess I'll start my story. Do you mind if I sit here? Can you see me? I'm a little short. No one will ever tell the poor black woman living in the hood that she needs to drop everything and care for herself. No one will ever tell her that America will work you to your grave. And if you're lucky, someone will eulogize your existence by saying, yes, she was a strong black woman. She worked two jobs without insurance, graduated college with honors, raised six children, and loved her spouse of 14 years through rough times. She was an activist in her community, and she didn't kill any racist white folks in the process. <laughs> now pass the hat so that we can pay for the repass and rent for another month in her absence. Most, ass most assuredly, no one will ever ask her, have you ever wanted to be free? Have you ever wanted to drop that sopping mop and perfectly marinated pot roast in the middle of the damn floor and go running in the street screaming at the top of your lungs, I'm out this mother and bet not nobody tried to stop me. Well, I'm here to trigger the SOS, to wave the white flag and throw up the deuces. Ladies, our freedom has been co compromised. And whether we consciously or unconsciously gave it up through marriage or becoming mothers, or maybe you, like me, never felt like you had it, it doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that we have done ourselves a major disservice. And yes, I know what I'm saying is controversial. I mean, what woman gets up on a public stage and says that at a certain point in her life, she felt a lot like Django right before he goes crazy and uses the whip to beat white slavers. Aren't we supposed to love our spouses for better or worse? And did we decide to birth those little darlings from our vaginas? Yeah, yeah, I've heard it all. You know, you should be grateful that people, you have, you're surrounded by people who love you. And you know those children didn't ask to be here and there are plenty of women who want to have children and can't. Well, this is all well and beside the point that I'm trying to make, which is when we willfully neglect ourselves, we do our families and ourselves a great injustice because we're not whole beings. This portion of me goes to the family, and this portion of me goes to the community, and this to my job, and this small portion is saved for sex on Saturday night in hopes that it might make me feel good enough to do this foolishness all over again next week. So, freedom came for me on a nice warm summer day. Oprah calls it the aha moment. But if you had been there, you would have called it my moment of mania. I mean, my partner has dubbed it my wild-eyed, I'm breaking the hell out of here midlife crisis. <laughs> the poor thing, <laughs> she didn't know whether to be scared or excited. Anyway, I heard the call to freedom just as clear as you are hearing my voice as I sit in front of you today. It went something like this. <clears throat> Yoo-hoo! Yeah, you, mommy with the bad hair and brittle nails and shoddy nerves, the one who gave up her dreams and wild child imagination, my name is Freedom. Do you remember your name? It was then that I started planning my getaway year, my spirit year, my New Orleans year. I was so excited, and the planning alone breathed new life into my soul. I told everybody and anybody who would listen, I was going to New Orleans. And everybody knows I love New Orleans. However, when the time came for me to board the plane from Chicago to New Orleans, I was visibly shaken. 
Right about that time, the last people-pleasing nerve that I had left kicked in. And I started questioning myself. Oh my God, what had I done? What, what kind of woman leaves her kids and her spouse in Chicago and just runs off? Would they be all right? And if something happened, what would people think of me? Internally, the real problem was that I knew that this day would be a game changer, that I'd have no excuse I'd have to release and deal with myself. I also knew that I, once I was done with my stay there, I wouldn't be the same when I returned to Chicago, if I returned to Chicago. My radical mission was to actively heal myself and to learn to love myself again. Now, I won't pretend that New Orleans doesn't have problems of its own or glorify it as this mythic place. However, there is something to be said about going to a city where there's massive healing going on. And when I stepped off that plane, it was as if my ancestors spoke to me on that sacred ground and said, you are here, you are safe, and you can heal. Well, that's all they had to say. That's all I needed to hear. I gave myself permission to do things I hadn't done in over 25 years or ever. On Sunday, I danced, and that became my prayer and worship as I two-stepped through the streets of New Orleans to Second Lines. And I danced my version of the bamba, my version of the bamba, in, in, um, in Congo Square. I biked in the rain, I ran at sunrise, I sang loudly at the moon at midnight, and I made offerings of molasses and honey at Lake Pontchartrain to the Orishas, Yemaya, and Oshun. I took red wine and cornmeal to entrances of cemeteries to please Oya and ward off death. I allowed mambos and iyawos and spirit guides to help me heal. And bit by bit, I began to know my name, to call my name, to reclaim myself from between the spaces of societal hatred and self-neglect. I awakened in me the free woman who lay dormant for far too long. Now I've since returned to Chicago, not as a new person, but as a better person. I am still the person who cares for others, but I now know that I am the first person that I need to take care of. When the ancestors check in with me and they ask, Keisha, what does your freedom look like? What does it smell like, taste like, and how does it sound? Is it orgasmic? I say, my freedom looks like the splash of my cowboy boots attached to my feet as I dance in the mud at Jazz Fest in New Orleans. It smells like fresh cut lemongrass after a summer rain in Chicago. It sounds like black and brown babies in my neighborhood asking me, Miss Keisha, how many miles did you run today? And then the sounds of their voices as they giggle and say, wow, after I tell them, five, 10, 13 miles, babies. Ancestors. My love for myself tastes like healing salt water of Brazilian beaches, sweat and tears. And is it orgasmic? You can bet your sweet bottom it is. Because if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Saying that right. I'm not rolling my R's. I've been told I didn't roll my R's. So, okay. Ms. Ricardo. This mic doesn't have a lot of pull, so let me just step back a little bit.
I almost talked myself out of visiting Dino in Spain. I articulated my rationale just like any first year doctoral candidate of social and cultural analysis at New York University would. No, Dino, I don't travel to Europe. It's the progenitor of empire. Those colonizing nations ruined the world. <laughs> My plan for the summer was to finally train at a Thai boxing camp in Thailand, in Bangkok, or touch ground in Africa, Ghana, Madagascar, it didn't matter, just anywhere on the dark continent. I was determined to do the things I missed while marooned by an abusive boyfriend for two years and a decade of the equally codependent dynamics that come with being an artist and activist. Ricky, shut up. Just come, I'll get you to Africa. Dino said. It was hard for me to trust guarantees. Once, my sociopathic ex promised to stop hitting me. Then later that night, fucked the guy in the basement of our Brooklyn brownstone while I slept upstairs. I'm serious, Dino. I'm serious, Ricky, Dino assured. We'll go to Morocco. I told myself, Dino's not a sociopath. He's a flamenco dancer. <laughs> so, the day after my spring semester ended, I found myself on a plane to Spain. In three days, Dino and I worked our way from Madrid to Barcelona to Malaga, and then to the coastal town of Algeciras, where ferries launched hourly to Tangier. At the narrowest point, only 8.9 miles of ocean separate Spain from Morocco and North Africa, but that short distance was closed immediately when I noticed we were the only non-Moroccans on that boat. I became vigilant about not looking or smiling too long at Dino. Look, I didn't survive the south side of Chicago just to get stoned to death on vacation by the male Muslim passenger majority on that ferry. I'm not racist. My Islamophobia was only directly proportionate to the homophobia the Lonely Planet Guide caution we'd encounter in Morocco. We sat side by side. I remained still in my seat to prevent any movement that could be interpreted as Western homosexual infidel. <laughs> and then suddenly, Dino's knee sailed beneath the borders of our armrest to press against mine. My eyes scanned the ferry to make sure no one saw. His leg hairs tickled even as his knee moved in circles against mine, but my eyes couldn't relax until they spied the woman sitting an aisle away. She was also going undercover en route to Morocco. In Algeciras, that same dark-skinned woman boarded with long dyed blonde hair on display. But right then, I witnessed those yellow inches sink into arms and fabric. She wrapped the hijab as smoothly as we glided into the port of Tangier past midnight. A few hours later on that first night in Morocco, I realized we should have considered additional advice from Lonely Planet. The smiling man who spoke good enough English to convince us to follow him to a hotel and refused to leave our room until we surrendered the money in my wallet and one of Dino's t-shirts was the kind they warned about. Fuck, Rick Rock. I like that shirt. It was my brother's. And it was from Banana Republic. <laughs> you did the right thing. We don't know what he would have done, I said. If someone steps to you, and wants your shit, give it to him, kid. My mom would repeat as a tip for surviving growing up on Chicago's <laughs> South Side. Even at five years old, I knew enough to trust the woman that didn't end up like her classmates in the obituary clipping she tucked between the pages of her high school yearbook. But I always wondered how my streetwise mom thought sending me outside in pastel polo shirts and cartoon dinosaur socks could be anything else on the streets but an invitation to get punked. Be a good boy. Someone hits you? Don't hit back, just run, she'd always say. And my ass ran often. The smelly, peeling, pink walls of our first night accommodations in Morocco was diluted by the exhales of hash. I peeked up while puffing on our joint, and my eyes traced the curve of his bald head like they had so often on my laptop screen. For months, all we had was the internet to connect. We've come a long way in six months, I thought. Okay, that past December, our mutual friends orchestrated our meeting while we were both home for the holidays in Chicago. The next few weeks, we hit the hipster hotspots gentrification brought to my neighborhood, drove to his family's bowling alley and diner in the suburbs, and he even spent a weekend with my family when record-breaking snowfall and cold provided an excuse not to leave our house. I wish I met you when I was in a better place, 
He said the morning he left back to Spain, referring to his rocky recovery from his most recent relationship. I expected further contact to fly away with Dino back to Spain until a few weeks later when he messaged me on Facebook with a life-altering proposition. You want to Skype? <laughs> After that, our webcams brought our respective Madrid and New York studio apartments into intimate proximity nightly. Now, here we were, cuddling in Tangier, sharing a twin bed and a joint. I exhaled and softly said, I can't believe I'm seeing you finally, and not through an intermediary. There's that word again. It's a screen, Ricky. Just fucking say a screen. <laughs> I laugh, then shifted in stone realization. Holy shit, Dino. We're like from Illinois. Like the fucking state. Just then, the forium wailing of prayer calls from Tangier's minarets blaringly shot into our room. Oh my god, that means so much more right now, he groaned. It did. People where we're from are born and buried in the Midwest. We made it out a long time ago, somehow still found each other, and right then, were together in Africa. But neither of us were strangers to foreign lands. Growing up, Dino's Greek immigrant parents made sure he spent summers on their native island of Lesbos, and my family annually visited my grandparents in the politically fundamentalist and intellectually underdeveloped country of Texas. <laughs> Coming out for him wasn't easy. It meant leaving his family's house and working at three restaurants at once while living in a friend's basement to save money for his move to Spain. I stared down at him, falling asleep on my chest, and realized how much I looked up to him. I wasn't as brave. Admitting that I was gay at 25 meant fucking a guy in an alley then sliding into a depression made worse by Chicago winter. When you're gay and Mexican American and poor rather than a wealthy white boy, there's no guarantees that ultimately it gets better, like Dan Savage's campaign assures. I never understood myself as entitled to the good life as long as I held on long enough for the world to rescue me from my immediate confines or myself. I didn't have Dan. I had my mom during that depression. I don't, know if my, I don't know if my mom knew why I was depressed. She never asked questions. She just woke me up at 5 a.m. every morning to run with her. Get up. Let's go. You'll feel better. We jogged down the frigid lakefront and back home before sunrise. She checked her stopwatch and reiterate, you just try each day, kid, and hope you do better than the one before. Our second day in Morocco wasn't just better than the one before, it was fucking breathtaking. That morning, we hurried, we hurried onto a bus out of Tangier. Four hours later, we were in the blue city of Shafshawan. Our strides were slow and our breaths deep as we dove into the never-ending tides of blue-painted buildings. Shafshawan was more beautiful in person than in the images of our Google search. I discovered later that night that Chef Shawin was significantly less charming when we were really fucking lost. While Dino struggled to memorize the fast-pointing fingers of a loyal, of a local, I stood nearby with Ramona, a dreadlocked fire dancer from Atlanta that rode the bus with us to Chef Shawin and joined us for dinner. You see, this is how I knew you motherfuckers were gay, she whispered. Y'all be asking everyone for directions. If I was with straight guys, we'd be in Algeria by now. <laughs> Asking for directions. I'll take it, I thought. My uncle Chavo was the first person to call me gay when I was about four. His claims were substantiated by my desire to wear my mom's high heels and play Eartha Kitt's Catwoman rather than Adam West's Batman. During family parties or while alone in my grandmother's basement, he'd always call me gay or sissy. I remember us alone in that basement and staring into his tinted aviator glasses as he explained, you're a brat and a little faggot. He then marched upstairs and took my youngest uncle, sister, and cousins to the movies without me. I remember my mother's angry warnings to my father. Tell your family to keep their fucking mouths shut, Pedro, or I'll go off on them. You're a good boy. Don't listen to them, she'd say to me. You play how you want to play. That didn't happen. Instead, I learned how to play how I wanted when no one was looking. 
I didn't realize those moments of secreted superhero drag and prancing in Payless heels were acceptance of my uncle's teachings that some boys are not born good enough to experience the abandon, innocence, and pleasure of play. We laughed all the way back to our hotel in Chefchaouen. We threw ourselves onto the bed, ready to close our second night in Morocco when Dino rolled on top of me and whispered, I love spending time with you. I was stuck somewhere between accepting and protesting his declaration. I licked my lips and let slip. Me too. He studied my face and asked, how'd you get that scar? Which one? His finger tapped the one on my left. I explained it happened when I was seven. I ran into a wall while hurrying to lock my sister out of our house while playing our made up game that we appropriately titled lock each other out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> then I explained the one on my right. My ex punched me while I slept one night, sending me to the bathroom with a bloody face. How did I ever stay with someone who could do that to me? I asked my mom over a bottle of kava a few weeks after our breakup. You gave up on yourself, Ricky, she replied. Does that stuff ever come back to people like him, Mom? I asked, staring at the rising bubbles in my glass. Do they ever get their karma? Who cares? What's important is that you get to pick better if you want. You have to insist on better for yourself. That evening with my mom was the first time I realized that there was a sick solidarity in my relationship with my ex, a silent admission that maybe I too wasn't worthy of a shot to bubble up. On the morning of our third day in Morocco, Dino and I made a pilgrimage up a mountain to a mosque overlooking all of Chefchaouen. We didn't dare kiss like the young Muslim man and woman that we passed as we made our way to the terrace ledge. Though we sat a few feet apart on that wall, the security guard peered at us as he made his rounds. Let's listen to the sounds, invited Dino. What do you hear? Cars sheep, and them. I finished, pointing to boys playing soccer in a concrete lot lodged in the mountain down below. We sat in silence. He abruptly scooted right next to me and said, kiss me. Before I could tell myself anything else, I leaned in and kissed him. And I confessed. I wanted to sit by you and do that, but I was scared. I know, he nodded. That's why I helped you. He turned back out toward the view. I followed his lead. And as I turned to admire the blue city now glowing so blue in the bright North African sun, I decided to insist on better for myself. I let my knee drift a few inches to press against his, kissing it in slow, soft circles. Thank you. <laughs>